Good afternoon. I want to welcome everybody to today's event. This is our sneak preview of the model ETF portfolio. You got John Hopkins here. Uh, Tom Bowley going to be jumping in in um, just a minute. I really want to wel welcome everybody uh, who's new to Earnings Beats. Really appreciate you taking the time uh, to stop in. And of course, want to welcome our seasoned veterans as well. Great to have all of you um, supporting us like you do. This is a, a pretty jam-packed month uh, for webinars. We've got this webinar tonight. Uh, tomorrow night's the Options Max Payne webinar. That is a members-only event. Uh, that's for people who are uh, full members as well as our trial members. So if you happen to be um, somebody who's not on trial, you can get a no-cost trial for seven days and come into what I think is one of the most fascinating events of the month, the, the Max Payne, where Tom examines the uh, major indexes uh, along with individual stocks and identifies those that could be uh, potentially ready to make a big move as we get into options expiration Friday. The last couple of sessions have been some amazing results in terms of some of the um, the stocks that Tom has identified that could move uh, either lower or higher. And I imagine with the market at an all-time high right now, it's going to be pretty fascinating. The Saturday coming up is open to uh, the public, anybody who's part of the community. This will be a sneak preview of uh, Q1 earnings. Earnings season's getting ready to kick into high gear. And Tom's going to give you a preview of what he's going to be covering when we actually have the Q1 earnings event the following Monday, a week from that, uh, at, from that uh, Monday. And of course, next month on the 19th of April will be the draft, the actual draft of the model ETF portfolio that Tom will be talking about tonight. So there's just so much going on, and we really appreciate uh, you coming in and being part of this. It's been a, an amazing um, market recently, and I'm sure uh, there's going to be so much to cover uh, over this next couple of weeks as time gets everybody educated. Anyway, so let me go ahead and see if Mr. Bowley's in the house. I, I'm always grateful to hear his voice. Hope you're here. I'm right here. How you doing, John? Oh, good. I'm always glad to hear that voice. Otherwise, i got to grab the screen and uh, take over. So. Oh, yeah, I, might, uh, I might do that at some point just to see what you got. <laughs> Get me on my toes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That sounds good. I know there's a lot to cover here, so let me just step aside and I'll let you take over. All right. Sounds good. Uh, first, just want to welcome everybody. Appreciate you stopping by. Um, yeah, we're going to go through and, and talk a little bit about our model ETF portfolio. Um, we actually have the draft of the portfolio next week. So this is just uh, kind of giving everyone a little bit of a sample of what we go through and the things we think about and look at in trying to figure out what uh, to put into these portfolios. And, you know, it, it, there's a lot of background information. There's a lot of background um, facts that go into our selection process. Uh, evaluation of the overall market is a big part of it. And so I'm going to just hopefully uh, shed some light on some of the things that we look at and Hopefully uh, this will be somewhat educational for everybody. Um, before I get into that, um, I do wanna just go through a couple things. John did mention the Max Payne webinar. I'm gonna show you, uh, well, actually, let's go ahead and, and go through the uh, agenda first before I get into uh, sharing my screen and all. So uh, just, this is part of the introduction. Um, again, welcome everybody. Uh, then we'll go through some of the strategies, some of the things that we look at in terms of the overall market, um, different factors in trying to establish the portfolios, just different things that we want to keep in mind. Talk a little bit about the strong ETF chart list because that's where all of our ETFs come from. They come from the chart list. Uh, I do want to mention to everyone that we were having some technical difficulties with the strong ETF chart list today. Um, we had that all ready to go and to send out to everybody and we were having problems. Uh, I tried to download it into the account that I use for our webinars and, and shows and so forth. And I couldn't download it. I was uh, only able to download like three charts and it, then it was it came up said unable to download or something like that. 
Uh, so if you're getting that error message, don't worry, we're, we're on it, we're trying to get it fixed. I think it's over on the stock charts end. So I've been talking to some of the folks over at stock charts, um, but we will try to have that resolved, hopefully today, if not today, then by tomorrow. Uh, but we'll keep you posted on uh, the uh, updates there. And uh, if it's been corrected, I'll make sure I mention that in the daily market report tomorrow uh, so that you can go in and download. Um, limitations on ETF investing. There are definitely some limitations. Um, I feel like there are some limitations that maybe others wouldn't even view as limitations. But anyway, I'll go through all of that later. Evaluating the ETFs in trying to decide, okay, what are we going to include? What are we interested in? What are we not interested in? And then, uh, of course, the draft, which will be coming up uh, next week. So we'll wrap, wrap up everything with that. But uh, as part of this introduction, you know, John did mention the Max Payne. So I want to just show everyone uh, something with that, because I think this is uh, really important, especially from a trading perspective, not so much from a, um, make sure I got the right. Let me see if that works. Okay, I think that uh, works. Anyway, um, I thought what I would do is show you a, a stock that we provided last month. So this would have been the March uh, options expiration. So we do these Max Payne events the Tuesday before the third Friday of every month. So the third Friday of every month is when options expire. So we always look to the Tuesday before, and that's when we want to have these webinars just to go over some inefficiencies in the market and some things that maybe you want to be aware of. And if you're a short-term trader, maybe some things you can take advantage of. If you're a long-term buy and hold or you're you know, a position trader and you plan to hold for months, this isn't really anything that should concern you. Um, but from a short-term perspective, there can be opportunities. So Alibaba was one that we mentioned last month. So here was the Tuesday right before options expired. And Alibaba had been very weak and so we talked about the fact that there were a lot of in the money put options. Net in the money put value was off the charts, no pun intended. Um, and what that means is that it's, it doesn't guarantee us that the price is gonna you know, move back to the upside, but there's definitely a short term probability of a move to the upside because market makers can make a lot of money in the short term if they are on the, the short side and they switch and go long, drive the price up and reduce that in the money put premium, the net in the money put premium, uh, that, they, it can be a win-win-win and literally a, just a, a waterfall of uh, money. And so we always want to be aware of that as we go into options expiration. So Bob, Alibaba was one that we had provided last month. I'm just going to give you an example of what we're looking at this month. And I mentioned this one in the daily market report earlier today. Plug power. This thing's been going down forever. Well, I noticed that you know on this breakdown today, we've got lower lows. PPO is starting to turn up. So we've got a positive divergence. Also, the thing I had noticed, I'll annotate this and show you this breakout that we had. See this top back in the second week of December? When we broke out there, you can see the volume picking up. We never went back to that level. That was 2880 was the level. We never went back to 2880 until today. Today, we hit a low of 28.77, finished at 29.68. So we still have this breakdown, but we got the positive divergence. We've got this test of prior support. And the most important thing that I get into when we talk about Max Payne is the options. Now, if you go over to cboe.com, you can go through a few steps and I'll show you all this tomorrow night. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I want to talk about the ETFs, but I, for anybody that's new to the earnings beats, I just want them to have an idea, a sense of some of the things that we're going to talk about uh, tomorrow. But if you look at plug power, look at the open interest on the call side, everything that's in the money. And so when I say in the money on the call side, if the stock is trading at 2960 something, then if you've got a call at 30, you're out of the money. If you got a call at 29, you're in the money. So look at the number of options that are in the money on uh, plug power, not very many. Then you go to the put side, anything, any puts above or at 30 or above are in the money because the stock price is only at 29.68.
Well, at 30, you got 5,000 contracts. 31, you got 871. 2,000 at 32. 1,700 at 32.50. 1,200 at 33, and so forth. Almost 7,000 at 35. 4,800 at 40. 5,500 at 45. 1,399, almost 1,400 at 55. If I haven't done the calculation yet to see how much net in the money put premium is on plug power but I can promise you it's well, well, well into the millions, like many, 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 many millions of dollars. So, and I'm not saying that plug power is going to go up $10 over the next few days, but if it just went up a few dollars, you know, that's 10% from current price, that would save market makers a lot of money. And I don't know where the max paying level is. Again, I haven't calculated. I'll work on that tomorrow. But these are just some of the things that we like to point out in max pain, you know, some potential stocks that you could see turnarounds. Now, you know, I've seen these before where plug, you know, tomorrow or the next day may be down further and maybe it keeps going down. There's no guarantee it's going to go higher, but I've seen these moves to the downside midweek. And then all of a sudden something happens and the stock takes off uh, for a few days, a couple of days into options expiration and maybe even into the following week. And that's what happened to Alibaba last month. The stock was very weak. All of a sudden over three days, stock went up $15. Why? I think it was options. But uh, anyhow, this was just one example. I just wanted to point it out. So if you wonder what that Max Payne webinar is all about, this is what we try to do. We look for not just stocks that look like they could go higher, but also stocks that could go lower. So if you've had stock, a stock that's made a big run and you've got a stock that's heavily optionable or you, know, you, get, uh, you have a stock that uh, is traded heavily in options, it's possible that you have a ton of in the money calls and almost no in the money puts. And in that case, it would behoove market makers to drive the stock price lower into options expiration. So we're gonna be looking at both sides of it. We try to give at least a few stocks in uh, both directions, uh, but I think that you'll find that pretty fascinating if you are not a member of Earnings Beats. And if you're not a member, if you go over, you can just click on the join today. It's a $7 trial, but we'll refund you the $7. You get 30 days essentially for free. Um, so any of our webinars, anything coming up, the uh, ETF analyzer that I'm going to show you a little bit later in this presentation, you can download it and keep it for free. Um, so there's a lot of uh, benefits to signing up. Of course, let's get into some of this stuff now because uh, this is a much more important webinar in terms of looking at ETFs. And I know some of you are here just for the ETFs. Um, so let me see here. I did want to just point out anybody who is new or even if you're a current member um, and you want to extend or you're a monthly member and you want to sign up for an annual, check out our webinar special. Right at the top of the page, you'll see webinar special. This is going to go through Thursday. Since we have a couple of webinars this week, we'll extend it through Thursday. Um, but all everything we offer normally is $147 a month. We'll give you 13 months for $997. So it's a 48% savings off that monthly rate. So just wanted to make sure everybody's aware of that. All right, let's get going because we've got a lot to go over here. First thing I want to point out when I'm looking at the stock market and I'm thinking about our strategy, whether it's for stocks, whether it's for ETFs, is what kind of market are we in? What's the big picture? And I know, you know, it wasn't popular a year ago, but I kept saying we're in a secular bull market. We're in a cyclical bear market, short-term bear market. That's what was created by the pandemic. But we are in a long-term bull market. That is a secular bull market. And you can see, I mean, the stuff that we've been through, we had the big drop right before the 2016 presidential election. And then we you know, went right through that and came right back up. Then we had the trade war, 27, or 2018, 2019. And we had a few hits with the trade war. Then we had the pandemic. Well, here we are. On the other side of all of that, setting all-time highs. This is what secular bull markets do. If you look back into the 1980s and 1990s, there's your stock market crash in 1987. Now, it's a blip on the chart right now. It didn't feel like a blip back in 1987. And trust me, I was getting, I was just starting to learn about the market back in 1987. I, you know, I'd been investing for a few years, but for the most part, I didn't understand a lot about the stock market. I was always 
um, you know, very intrigued by the stock market, but I really didn't know a whole lot. And I remember going through 1987 thinking, wow, we're going to zero. And as it turned out, all that was with a, was a little blip in a secular bull market. And I think when we're looking back in 10 years, talking about the pandemic, I think that this move down in the pandemic is going to look exactly, already does to some extent, to what we saw back in 1987. That just was in our rear view, rear view mirror and I'm gone. Did we ever go back to those lows again? No, never. You know, when we went through secular bear markets, when we, when we printed the major lows back in the 1970s, did we ever go back there? No. 2008 financial crisis set that crazy low. Actually, it was in March of 2009. We were, went all the way back down to 666 on the S&P 500. Think we're ever going to get back down there? I say not a chance. Now, we're going to go up. We're, I think we're going to go up for the next several years, maybe next 10 years. I think next decade could be very bullish with the potential of cyclical bear markets along the way. So my first thought when I'm putting together a portfolio is I want to be invested. And not only do I want to be invested, but I want to be invested in areas that make sense based on secular bull markets. Now, I, I did this other chart for you. Let me see. Is it the, yeah, it's this one. Okay, this is a yearly chart of the S&P 500. This goes back 25 years. So each one of these candlesticks represents an entire year. First, outside of the secular bear market from 2000 to 2008, I mean, when you're in a bull market, I, I can go back even further. Let's go back 40 years. You don't see a lot of red candles. And a red candle is where you close below the open. So these red candles would be down years in the stock market. Do you, you don't really see many. You know, I, I get asked all the time, you're a perma bull. Why are you so bullish? Well, the market goes up almost every year. Why do I want to be bearish? Why do I want to bet against the market going up? I mean, look at this chart. Would you rather be on the long side or the short side? I mean, there are going to be some times, there are going to be situations where we're going to see some really serious problems developing. And when we do, then we're going to want to be out of the market. These, these secular bear markets just don't happen overnight. This one was almost three years long. This one was two years long. They don't happen overnight. It's a process they go through. And yet every time we have a dip, everyone wants to call a secular bear market. We're in a secular bull market. Now, what I've done here is at the bottom, see this rate of change? And I have the number eight in here. So down at the bottom, you can put in rate of change parameter eight. And so essentially what this is doing is calculating the rate of change on the S&P 500 over the last eight years. Now, why did I pick eight years? Well, if I go back over here, the S&P 500, April of 2013 is when we took out this double top. April 10th of 2013. Today's April 12th, 2021. That's eight years ago. So I wanted to see what the S&P 500 has done roughly over the last eight years. And you can see 123%. Now I want to show you my three favorite sectors. These are aggressive sectors and they tend to do very well during secular bull markets. Now, before I change it, remember this 123% right here over the last eight years on the S&P 500. Let's put it put in the technology. 341%. S&P is up 123. Technology is up 341%. Consumer discretionary, 192%. Uh, communication services, 218%. They're crushing the S&P 500. So in a secular bull market, if you believe we're in one, you're going to want to weight your portfolio more toward areas that have been performing well. I mean, let's pull up energy. How do you think energy has been doing? How about down 28% over the last eight years? So when folks say, why don't you like energy? Just because we went up for three months, I'm going to like energy. Long term, we're going down in energy. Energy has been a very weak area throughout this bull market. And the primary reason is because we've seen the um, dollar rising. So look at materials. Materials and energy tend to perform, you know, on a relative basis negatively when 
uh, the dollar is up. So the S&P was up 123%, materials 101%. So again, you look at that and you say, well, I'm losing money if I'm investing in materials. It's not even keeping up with the S&P 500. And then you go to defensive areas like consumer staples and it's 95%. Remember the S&P was 123%. So I know that there's this interest in wanting to be fully diversified. And if you want to be diversified and have your, you know, um, investments spread out, maybe even more heavily into defensive areas because you're nervous about the market, feel free. I mean, that's your choice. I'm just pointing out history and the way the stock market works. And when you're in a secular bull market, we tend to see strength coming out of the more aggressive areas. Now, another way to look at this is, and I'll pull up the relative strength. I have a relative strength sectors chart list that I use. This is technology. Now, this is just going back the last two years, but I could you know, change this and we could go back last eight years, which is during this bull market, um, secular bull market. And you can see technology just crushing the S&P 500. So doesn't it just make sense that if you're gonna overweight an area of the market, it might want to, you might want to overweight technology. Now, some might say, well, yeah, but it's made such a huge run that it can't keep up this pace. Well, I bet the same thing was said back in 2017, 2018. You know, technology is outperforming by a huge amount. It can't possibly do any more. And then two years later, we have this next big move. Technology companies can grow their earnings much more rapidly than, say, consumer staples companies. You know, when, when the economy is strong, businesses want to spend money to try and help them streamline, to make their businesses more efficient. They're willing to spend more money on better products. The problem with consumer staples companies is, you know, you might look at your 401k and say, man, I'm doing really well in the market. And, this, you know, I'm at an all-time high. My net worth is great. Does that mean you're going to go out and buy twice as much soap? Or are you going to triple up on your teeth brushing makes no sense. You know, those companies are going to sell basically the same amount of goods in a good market as they sell in a bad market. You know, I hope you don't say, well, you know, we're in a secular bear market. I'm going to stop showering. Uh, I'm not, I can't afford to use that soap. You're still getting so soap. You're still brushing your teeth. You're still, you know, doing, you're still buying cleaning supplies and you're still doing all the things that, um, consumer staples companies, you know, rely on you to purchase, you know, you're still buying those products. So that's why you have to be really careful when you're looking at this, uh, um, you know, when you're looking at the, the market and you're trying to figure out how to allocate your funds, you want to pay attention to the areas of the market that tend to do well during strong markets and areas that don't. And so that's what you want to uh, pay attention to. So when I'm looking at putting together a stock portfolio or I'm looking to put together an ETF portfolio, this is one of the major themes that I'm going to be considering. I want to be overweighted in technology, consumer discretionary, and communication services. And it didn't help us in this last quarter, I'll promise you. Um, in fact, if we go back over to the website and I pull up our homepage, I mean, if you go down here to the bottom, you'll see our model portfolio. It's up this quarter, but it's up less than the overall market, um, you know, the S&P 500. Now, since inception, we had a really good first quarter. Since inception, you can see that we're back almost to where the S&P 500 is. We're a little bit below the S&P 500. And our goal was to outperform it. So a lot of rotation this quarter. It was definitely a difficult quarter from a rotational standpoint. I think we're starting to see some of that money rotating back. Um, and that's going to have a big impact on our performance as, as we go through. I want you to just think about this for a second. If you have $200,000 in the market and you invest in the S&P 500 and it returns 8% a year, or you have that $200,000 in the market and it earns say 13% a year, after 10 years, that amount, that $200,000 at 8% grows to $431,000. At 13%, it grows to $678,000. So if, if I'm right, and over the next 10 years, we have this secular bull market, and I'm going to go back in here and show you this, because look at the returns on 
the average returns in a secular bull market. You know, 11% in the 50s and 60s, 15% in the 80s and 90s, and 13, and actually that number is probably higher. I haven't updated it in a while. It's probably, you know, getting close to 14% average return, maybe 13 and a half, 13.75, something like that. But my point here is that in a secular bull market, we want to take advantage of this. We want our money to grow faster if we can. And we're only talking about with these portfolios, uh, changing out these portfolios every 90 days. So it's not like you're putting it away for 10 years and, oh, by the way, there was a secular bear market in there. Oops, sorry. We're going to know as we're going through whether we're starting to see major breakdowns in the market. I think when you look right now, you see the Dow all-time highs, S&P all-time highs, NASDAQ getting back up near all-time highs, uh, S and, or the uh, small caps and mid caps recently put in all-time highs, transports all-time highs, uh, relative strength, transports versus utilities all-time highs, um, XLY, consumer discretionary versus the consumer staples on a relative basis recently, all-time highs. This doesn't happen in a secular bear market. This happens in a secular bull market. So we want to, you know, again, focus on the, the big uh, areas here and big picture. All right. Um, so those are, you know, some of our strategies, you know, secular bull market, um, relative strength. You know, we want to be looking at the various sectors relative to the S&P 500 and, kind of, you know, start to weight our portfolios based on what's beating the S&P and what we anticipate to beat the S&P. So it's not always what's beating, but if you're, again, in a secular bull market, just because technology takes a month or a couple months off doesn't mean I'm giving up on technology. If anything, probably means it's much better opportunity now that it's pulled back on a relative basis. Um, but let's move on. So strong earnings chart list, or excuse me, strong uh, ETF chart list. And I mentioned earlier, I'll mention it again. Right now we're having some uh, issues, technical issues. So if you've gone to our website and you've tried to download, I know we've gotten a lot of emails from members saying they couldn't, they weren't able to download it. Um, just understand that it, you know, we're, we're in the process trying to figure out what's going on. Um, now before, I don't know if it's still set up this way, but if you do, if, if the link is there and you pull it up, I think you can view the charts. I just don't think you can download them but the link may, may have been removed until we figure it out. Uh, so, uh, but we'll keep you posted and let you know. We'll try and get that fixed as soon as we can. All right. Um, I'm going to bring up at this point our ETF analyzer. So bear with me one second. Okay, and so what we have here is, this is the list of ETFs that were just added to our strong ETF chart list. So once we get that um, corrected, we'll make sure we get that uh, out to everyone. And you can download that. If you're a Stock Charts Extra or Pro member, you can download all of our research, all of our chart list directly into your account. It's a really cool feature. Um, so you, these are all the tickers. So once you get this chart list, once we're able to fix everything, you'll see all of these listed um, in the uh, chart list, okay? And after you go um, you know, through, you can kind of look to see which, <clears throat> excuse me, which ones you like, which ones you don't like. But this ETF analyzer, which you can download directly from, from our website, breaks down all of the, there are 53 ETFs on this new um, strong ETF chart list. 53 are on here. And each one of these 53 are listed on the spreadsheet, uh, giving you ticker, giving you name, giving you the top 10 uh, stocks in the ETFs, the percentage of the entire ETF that they represent. So when you look at this and you see this particular ETF, 78% are in, are um, you know, the top 10 holdings comprise 78% of the ETF. That tells you that this is a pretty concentrated ETF, not very diversified. Okay. Because most, you know, top 10 holdings are making up almost the entire ETF. Whereas you have something like this iShares mid cap 400 value, 
that the top 10 holdings only account for seven, well, 8%. So obviously, you know, there's a huge amount of diversification in there. So this would just be the first thing that you might look at is to say, okay, is this a concentrated ETF or is it a diversified ETF? Now, some of them might be diversified, but they might still all be, let me see if I can find one. Um, well, I mean, here's Vanguard Industrials. So, you know, it's a theme. We're talking about just industrials, but the top 10 industrials in this fund only make up 31%. So that's telling me that there's probably, you know, I'm making a bet on industrials as a whole, as opposed to certain industrials, if you know what I mean. So if I go into, for instance, um, let's look at this aerospace and defense, ITA. And I think this was included as um, Earnings Beats Digest article that we uh, issued earlier this morning. Now, I've got a tab that breaks down the top 10 holdings. So this is the ETF. This is the 13th ETF. So if I go over to top 10 holdings, I scroll over to 13 right here. Here's ITA. And check this out. Here are your top 10 holdings. So we're giving you not only the ETFs that look good technically, but then we're also backing it up, not just with the percentage of top 10 holdings, but we're actually showing you the top 10 holdings. So if you looked at an ETF like the ITA, I think it's really important to understand if it's a widely diversified ETF or if it's a concentrated ETF. If it's a concentrated ETF, you better like the stocks that are in it. Boeing and Raytheon make up more than 37% of this entire ETF. If you don't like Boeing and Raytheon, but you're thinking about jumping into industrials, this is not the industrial ETF for you because you're, this is really heavily weighted um, by just those two names. And then you can see the rest of them here. You add them all up, the top 10, you're 72%, nearly three quarters of the ETF in 10 names. So not nearly as diversified as some of the others. I mean, here you got, you know, the IWD, which is the small cap value ETF. And you can see lots of uh, percentages here, or not small cap value, just value. Um, looking at some of these names, I'm like, yeah, that's not small cap. Um, but you can see that this is going to be much more diversified. So you're getting into a value fund. You can kind of look at the names and see, you know, we got some big companies, they're more value oriented. And it's just giving you more information because at Earnings Beats, I think the most important thing with ETF investing is knowing what you own. You've got to know what you own. And I'll show you how that works with the uh, other spreadsheet in just a second. But you can come back here and any stocks that are in any of these ETFs that are also in our stock portfolios, our model portfolio, our aggressive portfolio, strong AD and income portfolio, if they're in any of those portfolios, we highlight them. So you'll be able to see which stocks um, in these are also in our stock portfolios, if that interests you. All right, I'm gonna go back over here now because probably the coolest part of this entire spreadsheet, in my opinion, is the sector allocation. Now here is how the S&P 500 is allocated currently. So 24% is in technology, 12% consumer discretionary, 11% communication services. So you can see the three areas of the market that tend to perform really well during secular bull markets only has about 47% of the total weighting in the S&P 500. And so some of the other areas, you know, materials, energy, utilities, real estate, consumer staples, healthcare, all of these are defensive areas or Energy materials I consider to be more neutral. I don't think that they're defensive. I don't think they're aggressive. I think that they can go up or down in any kind of a market. I think they're very dependent on the dollar. They're very dependent, especially energy, on geopolitical concerns and things like things of that nature. What's going on with commodity prices? You know, all of that factors in to those areas. Not so much are we in a secular bull market or secular bear market. Um, 
So I think, you know, we got to kind of pay attention to what's going on with the dollar there. But you can see that, you, you know, you're, you're sacrificing, you know, in the spirit of diversification, you're sacrificing returns by buying the spider, the SPY, which tracks the S&P 500, because you are automatically being invested in all these various sectors. And in a secular bull market, most of these sectors underperform the S&P 500. So some might look at it and say, I don't care. I want to be diversified. And that's fine. Again, it comes down to individual choice. For me, I want to be in, I'm, I'm very bullish the market. I want to be he more heavily invested in these areas. And that hurt us in this last quarter. And I'll show you how in just a couple minutes. Um, but, you know, we, when we go through the draft, which we'll do next week, we look to see, you know, what themes interest us. What are we trying to do? You know, why, how do we think the market's going to play out over the next few months? And if we're right, we want to be make, we want to make sure we're in the right places. Um, now in this case, you know, growth stocks hurt us, small cap stocks hurt us since January. Um, they were leading and then they kind of took a backseat. They rotated out. So uh, there were reasons for underperformance, but we still finished in the green. I mean, we still participated in the move to the upside. Or at least with a week to go, we're still participating. But we did underperform. But I'll show you some of those charts in just a minute. But what's cool about this spreadsheet is you can go in and you can decide. You can look through and say, you know, I want some of these ETFs. You can add your own ETFs down here. Put in your own ticker symbol, your, you know, uh, the name, um, you know, the total top 10 holdings percentage, and you can do your own allocation. You can get this information off of Yahoo. You can get it from fidelity.com. Um, and I'm sure there are plenty of places where you can go and find what um, sectors make up an ETF, you know, the percentages in each. And you can put all of that in yourself. You could add another 10 ETFs if you want. But the point here is once you, you know, select your ETFs and decide how much you want to put in. So this is a percentage. Let's say you're going to put in 100% into ETFs. And, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to type in some numbers, 10% here, 20% here, 15% uh, here, 15% here. 10% uh, here. I'm not even looking at what I'm doing. I'm just typing them in. 20% here, 10% here. Am I up to 100? No, it's telling me error, 85%. So I still got 15% to go. So I'm just going to go down here at the bottom. I'm just put 15% right here. All right. So that was really random. I don't even know what I just put into this portfolio. But now I've now decided to invest 100%. These are the ETFs that I've decided to put my money into and the percentages. And what this results here is in the yellow is it's taking and adding up the percentages of each of these sectors that are in those ETFs. So for instance, industrials in this ETF that we put 20% in, industrials are 15.77%. So 20% times 15% tells me we're going to have about 3%, maybe a little more than 3% of industrials just from this one ETF in our portfolio. And we're gonna take that and we're gonna add 10% of this 36% industrials. And so once you go through and put all these percentages in, it tells you based on the ETFs you selected, your percentages in each of these various sectors. Now you might look at this and you might say, well, this is what I really liked. And unfortunately, this is where a lot of people just end and they're like, okay, these are the portfolio, or these are the ETFs I wanted. Let me just get them. And then they don't realize that they just put 35% of their money in financials. And maybe that's what they want. And if that's what they want, that's fine. Again, know what you own. But you might say, well, wait a minute, that's way too much into financials. And I've only got 5% consumer discretionary. Wow. Well, I'm going to take one of these funds. You know, this is 10% going into a 100% financial. I, I'd rather put, you know, something into like a consumer discretionary that's heavily, there's 75%. So maybe what I do is I take that, get rid of it, and I come over here and uh, put in 10%. And then come back up. And now I'm equal weighted on my consumer discretionary. 
Financials, I'm still heavily overweighted, but maybe that looks better. So I think this is a really cool spreadsheet because you can still do all your research and literally in minutes find out how you're investing your money. You know, are you comfortable with these allocations? Do you want more in technology and do you want more in consumer discretionary? Well, if you do, maybe we need to find one that's got more technology. Here's one that's got technology. And this one's heavily in the financials. Let's take this 15% and let's put it down here. Again, I haven't even looked to see what I'm invested in. All I'm doing right now is just coming up with percentages. Now, all of a sudden, I've got technology at 31%. Consumer discretionary is a little above. Communication services down a bit. Industrial is higher. Financial is about equal to the S&P. And now I'm underweighting most of the other areas, especially here to healthcare, 13 to 4%. But I'm making the decision to do this. It's so cool to be able, I think, to put your ETFs together on a spreadsheet like this and see. And the reason that this is important is that at the end of the quarter, when you're looking back and you said, wow, the S&P 500, like I'm doing right now, by the way, with our model ETF portfolio, and I'm saying, wow, you know, the model or the S&P went up 8%, but our model ETF portfolio only went up 1% or 2%. I wonder why. Well, when we look back, we're going to see that we overweighted. And so I'm going to come back out of this now for a second. And I'm going to show you what I'm talking about up here. Because these are the things that hurt us in the last quarter. So right here, this was January 19th, basically. This is when we announced, this is when we did the draft for our model ETF portfolio three months ago. And we're getting ready to do it again. And you can see the S&P 500 went up. It was up really nicely. But look at IWF versus IWD. This is growth versus value. We were invested in a lot. You know, we weighted our portfolio more toward growth than we did value. And you can see for six weeks, growth was getting crushed versus value. But we've started to see a little of that come back. And as a result, all of our, even our stock portfolios have come back from where they were in terms of underperforming. They're not nearly as you know down as much as they were, um, which you know doesn't excite me. I want to be a, above the S and P five hundred, but it's better than where we were. Um, small caps. This was another theme. Well, you can see right now we're about where we were at the start of the quarter. So small caps really didn't add anything to our portfolio. Look at technology, where we were and where we are. Technology has been kind of all over the place, but down. This is one that hurt us. Consumer discretionary. It's bouncing back now, but it's been down from where it was in January. And then if you've been a member of Earnings Beach, you know our first quarter, remember we had renewable energy, which was up 80% in three months. It absolutely, it, car it helped carry our portfolio. We only put 5% in it because it was so, you know, we recognized that it was a volatile group, but we really liked renewable energy going into the last quarter, which was October 19th through January 19th. And like I said, that group went up 80%. It helped our portfolio and we outperformed. Well, in this quarter, the group that I was really liking, you can see Hack, which is cybersecurity relative to the S&P 500. Look at it moving up. It was looking really good and it continued for about another week. And then that combined with growth stocks failing and so forth, look at what Hack has done. So Hack, which I think is 10% of our portfolio has been underperforming. So I can point back now and I can look back and say, this is why my ETFs were underperforming. Not that they were bad ETFs. The themes didn't work. You know, the things that we were counting on didn't work last quarter. And that's going to happen from quarter to quarter, from time to time. You're not always going to get it right. Anybody who's been in this business for a long time knows you are never going to always get it right. The portfolio performance that we've had, if you go back and you look at these stock portfolios since inception, they're crazy. Yes, this quarter's weak, but this is our 11th quarter for the, or 10th quarter for the model portfolio. I think we've beaten the, beaten it eight out of nine times going into this quarter or seven out of nine, I forget. Um, but we're not going to beat every quarter. Maybe we will. Maybe we, you know, we still have till May 19th. Maybe we come back. But 
The point is, over time, you want to do better than the S&P 500, but you're not going to get it right every day, every week, every month, every quarter. It's just impossible. No one does. The best money managers out there can't do it. So just kind of keep all of that in mind. The other thing I'll say, too, is that, you know, other funds that I would say have similar themes to us, you know, what we've done. If you look at something like the ARK funds, um, ARKW, and look at where they were back in January, uh, right here. So this is January 19th. They're down. Well, let me get a six month. Might be able to see it a little bit better. So if you go back to that six month chart, here's January 19th. So they were at about 160 on ARKW. Now at 155, down 3%. If you look at, uh, um, is it FFTY, IBD? Yeah, Innovator IBD, you know, January 19th. I mean, it's flat. These are all really good um, ETFs that have great long-term track record and really have not performed well at all. And I'm looking back to January, but I mean, if we look at versus our stock portfolio, it would be February 19th. Look at the FFTY since February 19th. I mean, we were up 48, now we're at 45. So it's probably 5% down. And if you look at uh, ARC uh, W, which is the ARC web, I mean, here we were at 180 and now we're at 155. This is probably down 13%. So it's the theme. It's not necessarily, I, I think ARC, I think the ARC funds are awesome, but what they invest in isn't working right now. It's starting to work a little bit better, but I mean, there for three or four weeks, I mean, you can see the fund going from 190 down to 130 something. It lost about a third of its value in two and a half weeks. That's how brutal growth stocks were beaten up. You know, if you're, if that's your you know, theme that you're counting on and it just goes through a period of br brutal uh, performance, uh, you're going to underperform. There's no doubt about it. All right, uh, so some limitations over ETF investing. Well, I mean, the first thing, I mean, if you're into a fund like ARKW, you're, you're buying the basket of stocks. You're giving up complete control over making your own decisions about individual stocks. So somebody who bought ARKW back in February because it just kept going up and didn't realize that they were getting into a lot of growth stocks that are going to pull back, they're going to rotate from time to time, probably thinks ARKW is the worst fund ever now because of the huge decline in growth stocks during the period. But, you know, it's a theme. And their theme, I believe, comes back. I think it's going to come back very strong. But is it going to be in a week? Is it going to be a month? Is it going to be three months? I don't know. Uh, that's really hard to forecast. But I do think that this is still a great fund, even though it's underperformed. But I have no control if I buy the fund. I have no control over the stocks. They have managers. They're going to buy and sell the stocks they want. And if you own the fund, you're just going to ride along with it. So that's a major limitation because I like to have control. I like to pick my own stocks personally. So I prefer stock portfolios over the ETFs. But I understand why folks would rather have ETFs. It's definitely more diversified. It's not going to, for the most part, I mean, obviously this is still very heavily invested in growth stocks and took a big hit. But most of the time, if you've got a you know, well thought out portfolio of ETFs, you're not going to get hit huge to the downside. And I'm talking about you know, 30%, um, unless the overall market's you know, doing that. The other thing with ETFs, you gotta be careful about this is sometimes they invest in over-the-counter stocks or illiquid stocks, just stocks that don't trade much. I wouldn't buy them personally. So why do I want to buy an ETF that buys them? Again, that's just my personal preference. OTC stocks, over-the-counter stocks, they're not as restrictive in terms of you know uh, qualification on that exchange. I'm not interested in those stocks. I just see too much craziness, too much manipulation. Um, so I would rather be a little bit more regulated exchanges. Um, many stocks are in these various ETFs, whether it's ARKW, 
whether it's the ITA that I showed you earlier with Boeing and Raytheon. I mean, many of these stocks that are included in these ETFs are not on any of our chart lists at Earnings Beats. We do a lot of research. We got strong earnings chart list. We got strong future earnings chart list, which is based on relative strength. We've got raised guidance chart list. We've got short squeeze chart list. We've got um, seasonality chart lists. I mean, we've got, you just go on and on the number of chart lists that we have that are available for our members. Many of these stocks that are in these ETFs are not in any of our, any of our chart lists. They're not stocks that we've researched and feel good about. So to me, that's a limitation, at least from our standpoint, it's a limitation. The other thing is we pick these ETFs when we, when we go through and run a scan to come up with these ETFs on the list, uh, you know, on our chart list. So right now, the 53 companies that I showed you on the spreadsheet, those are based on a couple of different factors. One's volume. We like to make sure we have a certain amount of volume trading in the, in the ETF. Um, but a big factor is the scooter score, the stock charts technical rank. Now, scooters have their limitations. Scooters, when you go through and calculate a scooter, if you've gone into chart school and, calc and looked at their, the, the calculation, how you come up with scooter rankings, it, there's nothing in the formula that goes back further than about five, six months. So you could be in a group like Energy and Materials that's been going down for nine years and all of a sudden it shows three, four, five good months and they shoot right to the top of the list as being some of the strongest areas, even though they've been in a nine or nine year downtrend. That is a major limitation when we're only factoring in the scooters. Well, that's one of the factors. Um, and it's one reason why sometimes I'll lower the scooter score because I want to make sure we're getting a, a wide enough representation of areas like technology that have been weak over the last several weeks and might be losing ground on their scooters. I still wanna make sure we have access to some of those ETFs. And then uh, finally, I mean, another limitation of ETF investing is if you're following us, our strategies and our methodologies may be completely different than yours. You know, So that's maybe a little bit more of a limitation on your end that, hey, you know what? I don't care about the way Tom is doing this, or you know, maybe I care about some of it, but I don't care about this other part. Um, so if you're paying attention to the way we're putting together port ETF portfolios, that's gonna be a limitation on your end because, and then that's why we give you the ETF analyzer spreadsheet because, hey, if you don't like what we're doing, we're giving you the strongest ETFs based on the criteria we use. And then we're giving you the, the spreadsheet, go in and look at it. And if they're, if you like value, you're going to find some values, some value ETFs on there. If you want growth, you're going to find some growth. If you want index funds, you know, widely diversified, you got those. If you want something like that ITA, the industrial uh, ETF that focuses on defense and aerospace, and you like 37% being invested in Boeing and Raytheon, you got that. The point is, You've got a lot of research at your disposal to take a look at and make your own decisions. And you may not pick your ETF portfolios from this, but I guarantee you that there is some information on in our research platform on ETFs for everybody. All right, so evaluating ETFs. Now, you know, evaluating ETFs isn't much different than kind of what we already talked about. When I evaluate an ETF, I'm looking at themes. So I told you, you know, we're in a secular bull market. So I'm looking for something that's going to outperform in a rising market. To me, that is going to have me focusing a little bit more heavily toward technology, consumer discretionary, and communication services. Financials, this is a good market for financials. Interest rates are moving up. I think financials will do well. And honestly, I think industrials will do well. I, want to, I really want to concentrate on the five aggressive sectors. I do that in the stock portfolios and I do it in the model ETF portfolios. So you might look at it and say, well, I disagree with you. I don't like all those aggressive stocks. I don't want to be in growth stocks. I want to be a little bit more conservative. I'll take value. I want dividend payers, whatever it is that you're, you know, 
you're looking at, and that's fine. But you might say, I want to go out on my own. You know, I might like two or three of your ETFs, but I want to get a little bit more defensive on these others. And so, you know, I'm going to evaluate, but then you have to look at it and say, okay, is this, is this right for me? And, you know, we're not registered investment advisors. And I try to point that out at every webinar we do. Um, you know, we have disclosures on our website because there's no way that I can possibly know everyone's personal financial situation and everybody's objectives and strategies are going to be different. There's no way that we could put together, a, you know, and it's one, one reason why we got away from sending out individual stock alerts many, probably, you know, a couple few years ago, because we would find that there would be members maybe that don't want to take risks that don't understand the market the way I, you know, would, you know, that I know the market and that I think maybe others know the market. And so we, we have members that were taking risks that were not appropriate for them. And I feel horrible when these don't work out, you know, stocks don't work out. I mean, I feel horrible when the portfolios don't work out, you know, we're having a rough quarter this quarter and that's certainly adds some stress on my end. I can promise you. Um, but we try to be as, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Transparent, maybe, as we possibly can in saying that this is the approach we're taking. This is why we're doing this. And then everybody's got to take their own personal investing strategy into account to decide, okay, this is what I want to do, or this is what I don't want to do. So we're going to be looking at themes. We're going to look at, uh, you know, are these ETFs diversified or concentrated among just a handful of stocks? If they're widely diversified, then the theme has to work for me. So in other words, if, if I'm really into small caps, then getting into a small cap 600 index fund is, I'm fine with that. Yeah, there's wide diversification, but I really like small caps. So I'm okay being diversified. Now, if I'm if it's not really a group like the S and P 500, I'm trying to beat the S and P 500. So I'm not going to put the S and P 500 in there because I can't beat the S and P 500 with itself. So that's going to be something that I'm going to be considering when I evaluate. Um, you know, how diversified is an ETF? I like the concentrated ETFs, like that ITA, if I like the stocks that are heavily weighted. If if Boeing and Raytheon were two of my favorite stocks, which they're not. They're, getting, they're actually much better. Actually, I probably like Raytheon a little bit more than Boeing. But if they were my two favorite stocks in the market right now, then that would be automatically one of my ETFs that I like because I like the stocks. So that's what I'm going to do when I go through this entire evaluation process. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. All right. Um, let me see here. Lost one of my screens here, so just bear with me one second. All right, so that brings us basically to the draft, which is next Monday uh, after the market closes. And I'll be going through a lot of what I've talked about tonight. I mean, I'm going to be looking at those 53 ETFs. We may update one more time. I'm going to wait and just kind of see what the market does and run a scan and just see if it would add many or if it doesn't really change the list, then I'm not going to do it. Just update, you know, two or three. I, I might even do it, make it a little bit more inclusive. So instead of having 53 um, ETFs, maybe the next time we'll have 75. So the spreadsheet will have 75 on it instead of 53. That's kind of what I'm looking at um, in terms of getting prepared for that draft next week. But really, for me, it's all about doing your homework studying the themes, looking at the overall market. Are we in a healthy market? And I, I do this every, I do it much more often than just every 90 days. Um, I try to do it every week or two where I'll kind of go through and just see, hey, am I missing anything? Are there any warning signs out there? That sort of thing. When we went into these last couple of quarters, I said, I really believe the stock market was going higher, which we have. I said the more challenging aspect was trying to figure out with the vaccine news that was out back in November, 
what the rotation was going to be. And that was a real big wild card back in January and even February when we did the stock portfolios. And for the most part, I stuck with growth and that has turned out to be the wrong um, selection. I don't think it's the wrong one long-term, but this quarter uh, definitely has been the wrong theme. And so that'll be something that I'm going to be giving a lot of thought to over the course of the next week. So anyway, I don't know, John, if there were some questions, um, but I was trying to keep it to about an hour, which is just about where we are now. Yeah. Uh, somebody, a question came up. Uh, the coming two months, May and June, are seasonally very weak. Are you planning to take the seasonality into consideration when selecting stocks or ETFs? Well, I completely disagree with the May and June period being weak. Um, now, I mean, you know, there's this go away in May theme that the media talks about all the time, but I have not really seen it. Now, there are periods during the summer months. I've, I've said the worst time in the market historically is July 17th close to September 27th close. That's it. I mean, and I've got the numbers back to 1950 that backs it up. Um, May, June, I mean, there's some really bullish periods in there. You, you know, middle of the month tends, both of those months, middle of the month tends to be a little weaker. Um, but opening of the month and the close of both those months tend to be very strong. And um, let, me, let me see what uh, comes up when we do the season now. This only goes back 20 years. But if we pull up the S&P 500 for the last 20 years, uh, May goes up on average, four tenths of 1%, June down five tenths of 1%, July up 1.3, August rises two tenths, September uh, down four tenths of 1%. So just looking at that alone, I would say, okay, maybe there's a little point there because May and June have been kind of offset. Um, you know, if we go back, what is it, the last, roughly the last 10 years, we've been in a bull market. I mean, keep in mind this 20 years includes 10 years of secular bear market action. So, you know, if we just take a look at the last 10 years, I mean, look at the percentage of, of, of times that April, May, June, and July have gone higher, 90, 78, 78, 89. And look at the average returns, April two and a half, May is two tenths of 1%, June's 1.3, July's 2.5. I mean, now this is just the last 10 years, but this is more, you know, this is, um, this is more secular bull market action, and that's what we're in. So I would say that. The other thing I would say, and this is something I think that's really um, kind of crazy when you pull it up, is when you look at the, the uh, XLK technology relative to the S&P 500 over the last 10 years, if you go through and you add up the first month of each calendar quarter, January, April, July and October, and then you do the same thing for February, May, <clears throat> um, August, and November, and then do it for the third month of the, look at the third month. March is up a little bit more than the S&P 500. June is lower, uh, September's flat, and December basically is flat. So we don't get that outperformance from technology in the third month of each calendar quarter like we would during other months. And, you know, so that's something that's definitely more pronounced um, as we go back. And I mean, I'm sure if we went back 20 years, it would be the same, very similar. You know, there's March, there's June, uh, there's September, and here's December. Another way to look at it, now that it's getting a long answer, but if you look at the S&P 500 and go back, I'll uh, we'll start with 10 years, um, and you add up the first month, Let's, I'm just going to do it real quick. 1.2 and 2.5 is 3.7. July is uh, 2.5. That's 6.2 total. October, 6.8. So your average S&P 500 return, first month of a calendar quarter, 6.8%. February and May, 1.4. August, 1.9. November, 3.1. That's five. So 6.8% first months, 5% second months. March, 0.3, June 1.3 is 1.6, September 0.1, 1.7, December 1.8. You add one more tenth. So it's 6.8, 5%, and 1.8% on the S&P over the last 10 years. March, June, September, and December is when you want to be more careful, in my opinion. And it's 
after earnings season. It's, there's nothing else to talk about. So let's talk about all the reasons why you need to sell technology stocks right now. In my opinion, that's what happens. So kind of went on a tangent there, but uh, oh, anyhow, good. any other questions? Um, rather than just take a view on a sector, growth value, consumers, et cetera, and focus on that in the draft, couldn't you also pick best looking charts or earnings beats portfolio that would be technically best group regardless of your opinion on sectors that will or won't necessarily work well? Um, I kind of lost track <laughs> of that question as we're going through. I mean, what about the portfolios? Well, it's, it's saying rather than just take a view on a sector, growth value, consumers, et cetera, and focus on that in the draft, couldn't you also pick best looking charts or earnings beats portfolio that would be technically best group, regardless of your opinion on sectors that will or won't necessarily work well. And I'm not sure, you know, it's a bit of a bit of a confusing question because we're not picking individual stocks, right? We're looking at ETFs. Yeah, and the ETFs, I mean, you know, the charts, the market's been going higher. So most of the ETF charts are going to look pretty good. Um, but it's really the individual stocks and the themes within those portfolios that matter <clears throat> going forward. I mean, when the question's asking, you know, if we would pick the best looking charts or our earnings beats portfolio, that would be a technically best group. Um, I think that's kind of what we do when we put this together. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm looking for the themes that are working. I mean, like in January, you know, small caps were, you know, on fire. So I definitely wanted to have exposure to small, small caps. Well, it turns out small caps uh, weren't the place to be now for these last three months. And so we saw that rotation and that, that certainly hurt. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, you know, for me, I think the, the big picture, and again, we're not gonna beat every quarter. It's just impossible. It's just not gonna happen. I'd love to. But I mean, you've got professional money managers that can't beat over the course of a year. So to try to do this every quarter and beat on, in a, on an every quarter basis is really setting the bar way too high. But I do think our strategy of looking for relative strength and looking for leading stocks and leading industry groups, leading uh, asset classes, those types of things are going to benefit the model ETF portfolio in the long run. I can't say you know from quarter to quarter, but I think in the long run, it'll benefit. All right. That's pretty much it. I want to remind people a couple of things. Number one, you get a copy of the recording. And number two, tomorrow, the Max Payne event, that is a members only. You know, tonight was anybody in the community, no matter your standing. But tomorrow is members only. So if you're currently a subscriber, you're going to get an invitation with the link. Or if you're a trial member, you can sign up for trial for free for 30 days. And I'll tell you something, Tom. I know you, you know, we're not going to spend time on it tonight because tomorrow that's what we're going to do. But the, the past several uh, events, have been, <laughs> there have been some fantastic calls. And again, I've got to believe, you know, with the market at all time high here, there's got to be some stocks that are stretched. And there's been some stocks left behind that might actually pick up some steam, uh, you know, over the next week or so. So I encourage everybody. If you're not uh, currently, you know, member a trial member, just sign up. Uh, it's really highly educational that I find it to be. I have come into these events the last couple months and listened to some of the things you've said about it, and I profited from it in terms of actually um, getting involved in some of these stocks that have been brought up. So I hope some people can join us. Yeah, it would be great. I mean, there's going to be – there's always some great opportunities, and it really comes down to um, – you know, market inefficiencies that uh, created by the market maker, um, you know, the, the, the market maker effect in our markets and the fact that you've got market makers that are, you know, when somebody buys an option, it's not like stocks. In, in the stock market, for the most part, if it's a liquid stock and you want to buy a stock, there's probably somebody out there wants to trade and wants to sell it. So you got a lot more matched uh, bids and asks. In the, in the option market, it's not as fluid. Now, there might be some stocks that are really heavily traded in options where you do have that um, you know, working out. But for the most part, I think a lot of folks, when they buy 10 calls of a, of a stock, 
you got market makers on the other side that are taking the other side of that trade. And as you get closer to options expiration, that op options expiration Friday, this isn't a long-term issue for a stock, but in the very near term, if market makers, if everybody's been buying a stock and it's been going through the roof and there are a ton of calls out there, market makers can save a fortune if they start to short a stock into those um, in, into options expiration. And likewise, as I was mentioning earlier with Alibaba last month, that was a stock that was under a lot of selling pressure going into options expiration. There were a ton of in the money puts, which meant market makers would or could potentially start buying the stock, sending it up into earnings. And we saw uh, Alibaba move up $15 in three days. It was like 7% or something um, that it went up in just three days heading into options expiration. And we had some others, like you said, that went the other direction. Yeah. You know, and in the daily market report, and the one I mentioned earlier today, I actually own Plug Power. I've been building a position, just little pieces here and there. Mm -hmm. Because when I look at all of the net in the money put premium that is on that stock, that'll guarantee, I guarantee you that's going to be one we talk about tomorrow because okay. the amount of money that's involved on that one. Um, but that's a stock that has almost no in the money calls on it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's just coincidental or what, but um, now that we're in options expiration week and you were talking about Baba, I mean, if you saw it today, it was up 10%. It was up 20 bucks. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, who, <laughs> anyways, I just thought that was well, kind of comical. I mean, if, you look at, if you look at the chart, it was back down at that 225 level that we talked about last month. I haven't looked at the options chain, mm -hmm. but you know, you have to wonder maybe if some, I mean, it was big news, obviously something happened with all that volume, but you, we've seen crazy news stories come out right during option expiration week. So I don't put anything past anybody uh, when it comes to options expiration week, we've seen some crazy activity. And I think it's always a good idea if you're a short-term trader to at least be aware of some of the uh, inefficiencies and some of the opportunities created. It's going to be interesting because I just uh, did a quick glance at the options, I'll tell you one thing, boy, there are a boatload of um, 240 calls that there's like 41,000 calls. There's 18,000 puts, uh, you know, on the stock at that $40 level. Um, that's not 40, $240 level, but this is going to really be interesting because um, there's a lot of people that, uh, are thinking the stock's going to go higher. So much can happen, Tom, like in the yeah. next few days. So it's going to be really fascinating to watch it. Well, yeah, and I mean, the other thing too, it's it, that's one strike price, but how many puts are at 250? How many puts are at 260, 270? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've really got to take a look at the whole picture because there could be a lot of in-the-money puts up at those higher prices. And really what the Max Payne does and what we try to do is look at this as kind of like, a, where's the equal point? Where's that point at which... Mm -hmm in the money calls and in the money puts offset one another and the balance, yeah. you know, is basically back to zero. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's the pretty important part that uh, we look at every, every month. So anyway, All right. for those of you, up that, here. Uh, yeah, those of you who'd like to uh, join us, um, all it takes is a trial membership. So uh, go over to earningsbeats.com, make sure you sign up and don't forget we do have the webinar special going until Thursday. All right, that's it. Uh, everybody have a great evening. We'll be back tomorrow for our Max Payne uh, session at 4.30, same time, same place. Everybody take care. Happy trading.